So I want to talk about something uh, that we just managed to do recently. Uh, so this everything I'll talk about today is joint with uh, uh, Jeff Kahn and, and Jin Young Park. Uh, so recently we managed to locate the threshold of the square of the Hamilton cycle and I'll try and tell you a little bit about this today. Uh, okay, so uh, to start with, uh, I'll just reacquaint all of you, though I'm sure this is unnecessary with what I'm going on about. Uh, so when we talk about thresholds, we mean we fix some increasing graph property. For example, you know, does my graph contain a triangle? Uh, any sort of property closed under adding edges. Um, and we look at the Erdős Rényi random graph. Uh, where we include edges uh, independently with probability p, uh, and we call uh, a function p star the threshold for this property if the probability of our random graph landing in this property uh, changes from zero to one around p star. Uh, so my notation here is sort of saying if p over p star is, is very large, then this probability tends to one, Whereas if p over p star is very small, this probability tends to zero. Uh, I should, of course, point out this sort of minor point that this is a tiny bit of abuse of notation. Strictly speaking, there's no the threshold, there's an equivalence class of them, but uh, I think it's a, it's a common abuse that we all sort of agree on, uh, and it makes sense to talk about the threshold for any uh, graph property. Okay, um, so ever since, uh, you know, random graphs were introduced by Erdős and Rennie. There's been a, a lot of attention uh, uh, given to locating the thresholds of uh, containing various interesting spanning objects in in our Erdős Rennie random graph. Uh, for example, when does your random graph contain a perfect matching? When is my random graph connected? Which, in some sense, uh, can be thought about in terms of spanning objects. Do you have a spanning tree? Uh, so questions of uh, containing um, spanning subgraphs have received a fair bit of attention. Should also maybe mention uh, containing factors, given that I mentioned uh, perfect matchings. Uh, but today I'll, I'll uh, talk about the powers of Hamilton cycles. Uh, so the graphs of interest for us, the spanning graphs of interest for us are the powers of Hamilton cycles. So everyone knows what a Hamilton cycle is. Uh, I'll tell you what the kth power of a Hamilton cycle is to start with. I call it CK over here. And all it is, is you take the Hamilton cycle and you join every vertex to things at distance at most K from it in the cycle. Uh, so what I've drawn here is probably something like C squared. Uh, and clearly, uh, from what I've said, uh, the k power of the Hamilton cycle has about k n edges, right? Okay, uh, and the question that I'd like to say something about today is what's the threshold for containing the k power of a Hamilton cycle? Okay, uh, and I'll sort of call that p star of uh, c k when we all sort of agree that what it means is it's the threshold uh, for containing a copy of the k power of the Hamilton cycle. Okay, so that's the setup. Uh, so let's start with some easy bounds. Uh, so trivially, uh, the threshold for containing the k power is at least something like n to the minus one over k. Uh, and so why is that true? Well, that's just a, a, a cheap first moment argument because the number of copies is essentially just, uh, uh, the num number of copies in the complete graph is essentially just the number of permutations, except you've got a quotient out by the fact that uh, cyclic shifts give you the same uh, cycle and uh, reflections give you the same cycle. So the total number of copies in the complete graph is just n minus one factorial divided by two, and each copy has a, P to the Kn chance of turning up because, as I just uh, mentioned earlier, these objects each have Kn edges in them. Uh, and so 
the number of copies is, is tiny when p is smaller uh, than n to the minus one over k uh, up here. So that gives us a, a lower bound on the threshold. We certainly need uh, our density of edges to be bigger than this in order to hope to contain a, a k power. Uh, of course, the most well studied example of this question is the Hamilton cycle itself. So not uh, a high power, but just C1. And it's a famous result of, of pushes that the, the, the correct sort of threshold is something like 2 log n over n. And I say dot, dot, dots here because we know so much more. We know uh, very precise sort of descriptions of, of when the Hamilton cycle uh, will turn up. Uh, but the only point I want to make here is that, um, for, at least for the Hamilton cycle, the answer is not 1 over n. It's not the trivial lower bound that uh, we just wrote down. And again, this is, we all know why this is true. Uh, this is because uh, at a density of something like one over n, we still have to deal with local obstacles. Uh, there, there'll be wet seas of small degree, namely of degree at most two, or strictly less than two. And so there's no chance of containing a, a Hamilton cycle. So it's not hugely surprising that the answer isn't one over n uh, for the Hamilton cycle itself. Uh, on the other hand, for powers strictly bigger than two, so for cubes and higher powers, we do know that the threshold is more or less, uh, or rather it's exactly n to the minus one over k in my loose sort of uh, definition of the word threshold. Uh, and this is a consequence of a much more general result of Oliver Reardon's, um, where he computes um, second moments uh, for a general spanning subgraph and derives some conditions under which the second moment method uh, gives you the correct answer. And that condition certainly applies to, uh, to cubes and higher powers, uh, which leaves you know, the, the square as, a, as an annoying sort of open case of this problem. Uh, and, and I'll tell you what was known about this uh, before we got thinking about it. Uh, so for cubes and higher powers, the first moment calculation that we did does give the correct answer. Uh, there is for the Hamilton cycle itself, this guess is incorrect because of local obstacles. So what do we expect for the square of the Hamilton cycle? Well, there's no local obstacle that springs to mind when you think about the problem. So it's natural to guess that um, the answer is in fact one over root n. The threshold for the square is one over root n. Uh, and I believe this is something that um, Derek and, uh, Dan Daniel and Derek conjectured when they initially looked at this problem. Uh, but something that makes the problem particularly sort of appealing is that higher moments don't seem to be useful. Uh, if you compute the second moment of the number of copies, it's, it's far too big. And it doesn't seem to be easy to salvage this in any way. Uh, if you condition on one square of the Hamilton cycle appearing in your random graph, uh, it changes the counts of lots of small subgraphs by much more than their standard deviation. And so it, it really sort of inflates higher moments. And it seems like a, a challenging sort of technical issue. Uh, and this is sort of therefore spurred on uh, developments in terms of trying to work out what this threshold is uh, by other sort of methods. Uh, so for example, uh, Derek and Daniela showed that from above the threshold is roughly uh, one over square root of n. Uh, namely, they show that it's at most n to the minus one half plus epsilon for any fixed epsilon. Uh, this was then refined by uh, Nenadov and Skorich who I believe got uh, it down to something like one over square root n times uh, a logarithmic correction, uh, I think the fourth power of log. And I think Richard Montgomery has um, at least an unpublished uh, improvement to their argument that got him log squared instead of log to the four. Uh, and maybe it's worth mentioning that all of these um, um, improvements are based on um, 
um, developing this method of absorption uh, in case you're familiar with it. And if you're not, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, okay, so, uh, so that's a little bit about the history of the problem. Uh, and so uh, the thing that I, I'll try and say a tiny, tiny bit about today uh, is this recent result with Jeff and Jin Young, uh, where uh, we believe that we've uh, pinned it down and got rid of all these extraneous logarithmic corrections, uh, the threshold should in fact be one over square root of n. Okay. Uh, I hope the, the statement of the, the result is, is clear to everyone. Okay, good. So the time I've got left, I'll, I'll sort of mumble a tiny bit about the proof. Of course, I won't be able to say very much that's enlightening in terms of actual computations, but I'll at least say something about why we managed to sort of, you know, get past the fact that um, moments don't work. Uh, okay. Uh, so the starting point of our proof um, is, or at least the thing that motivated us to, to do what we end up doing uh, was a recent result that um, we had with Keith Frankston where um, we proved this relaxation of the Khan Kalai conjecture due to Taliban. Uh, and I'll, I think it's worth uh, reminding you of the statement because this will uh, motivate things, some ideas that go into the proof. Uh, and the statement there is this. So let's call a hypergraph P spread if the fraction of that hypergraph uh, living over any fixed set S. So this is my notation, this uh, um, angular back brackets around S is my notation for the upset generated by a set. Uh, and a hypergraph is P spread. If the fraction of the hypergraph living in any upset generated by a set S like this uh, decreases quite quickly as the size of that set gets bigger. So it's at most P to the S. Uh, and the best choice of P here is, is typically what we call the, the spread of the hypergraph. Okay. Uh, and what do we show? Uh, we showed that uh, if a hypergraph is P spread, uh, then a random set of density P log N will almost certainly contain uh, an edge of H, right? Uh, so why am I mentioning this? Well, to start with, it already says something for the square of the Hamilton cycle. Uh, if we look at the hypergraph of all the copies of the square of the Hamilton cycle, uh, then it's just a calculation to work out that this hypergraph is something like square root of E over N spread. Uh, okay, and so just by appealing to this result, we immediately see that the threshold is is at most something like log n over square root of n, right? Uh, so our result uh, that I just mentioned already gives us a bound on the, on the threshold. Uh, but of course, we don't expect this logarithmic correction to, to actually be warranted. We imagine that the answer is something like one over root n. Uh, and that's where this little but comes in. Uh, so this hypergraph is indeed square root of e over n spread, uh, but in some sense, it's barely sort of spread like this. Uh, by which I mean, if you go looking for the sets S for which uh, the spread condition that I wrote down over here uh, is tight, well, those sets are, are really rare. It turns out that you have something close to equality in the spread condition only for sets that look like essentially like long chains of triangles in the square. And this is not, you know, this is, this is a small number of, of sets that you can sort of uh, hope that they won't change the, um, that they won't sort of uh, lead to complications and that one could somehow think of H as being better off than square root of error and spread. Uh, okay, and that's really um, the sort of starting point. 
it turns out that this is the spread of the hypergraph, but the number of witnesses to this uh, fact is, is quite small. The sets witnessing this are rare, and this sort of feeds into our proof of uh, this threshold result here. And in this particular case, allows us to get rid of this uh, extraneous logarithmic uh, factor. Uh, I'll maybe say one more sort of word uh, by how we can sort of exploit the fact that um, this hypergraph is, is the, the spread is witnessed rarely. Uh, I don't know if this picture is helpful at all, uh, but I'll try to say what's going on here. Uh, in the general sort of threshold result with uh, Keith Frankson that I mentioned, uh, the four of us show that um, if I give you a p-spread hypergraph uh, and, uh, and I pull out a random set s from that hypergraph and a random set w of just a, a, a completely random set of appropriate density, you'll typically see a picture uh, that's uh, drawn on the left here, namely that there will be some other set j in your hypergraph that w manages to chomp uh, a reasonable amount of. Uh, and we show this under the generic, generic assumption that h is, is p-spread. Okay? Uh, but if we shift our attention to this particular hypergraph, namely the hypergraph of all the squares of the Hamilton cycle, uh, then what we see is slightly different. It turns out that what you'll end up seeing typically is that for an S and W pulled out at random in exactly the same way as mentioned earlier, there'll be a, a, an edge J from this hypergraph inside the union, but W will end up chopping off a huge amount of this set. Uh, and this is what in some ways um, allows us to get rid of the, the iteration that's sort of required in, in, the, in the general case that leads to a, a factor of log n, uh, there is exploiting you know, features specific to this hypergraph, we can get rid of that, and that's where uh, we're able to get rid of the log n. So that's all I really want to say about the proof. So I'll, I'll stop with a, with a couple of open problems. Um, there are, there are, there's one obvious one, and one that's sort of a bit more speculative. Uh, the first obvious one is, can one pin down the sharp threshold for the square of the Hamilton cycle? So it's easy to appeal to uh, Ehud Friedgut's characterization of sharp thresholds to, to work out that the property of containing the square of a Hamilton cycle will certainly have a sharp threshold. Uh, and one expects it to be at exactly the first moment threshold, right? At square root of E over A. Uh, our proof's not um, precise enough to give anything like that. We get some constant uh, as opposed to um, um, the, what we think the correct one is. And that's a natural problem that uh, would seem to sort of merit investigation. That would be, be interesting to work out. Uh, the second sort of more philosophical question is, uh, is there something Going back here, is there something smoother that we can use in the place of spread? So I say smoother in that this condition here, it's sort of an L infinity type condition. You want this estimate to hold for every S. In other words, if you normalize this vector consisting of H intersect S divided by H all raised to the one over S, you're saying that the L infinity norm of that vector is at most P. Uh, but maybe the L infinity norm is not quite the right thing that's sort of predicting what's going on here. Here, we sort of had a particular example where even though we knew the L infinity norm and it was, it was, it was bad, the set of coordinates where you got close to this L infinity norm were rare in a sense that we could exploit. And I wonder if there's a, a general phenomenon there uh, some smoother notion of this uh, of spread that might control the threshold. Uh, and I think that's something that's also really worth thinking about. Uh, and I'll stop with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bagas.
Okay, thank you very much. So uh, there is one uh, question in the chat. Uh -huh. Oh, it's about sunflowers. Uh, yes, so um, I think to answer the question, I don't know if these methods will be enough to, to prove sunflowers or to get the correct bound, because at least for this approach, there are, there are these robust sunflower constructions which these approaches end up finding. And for that type of object, um, these bounds are in fact best possible. So, so your strategy would have to go looking for something a bit more delicate than what these things do uh, in order to get the correct bound there. Uh, okay. So a further kind of question, comment. Uh, so in your proof, uh, you kind of uh, go into this encoding, uh, uh, of uh, love it, uh, right. otherwise right. love it and company, and then you tune in uh, for uh, to to count for this uh, rare kind of. Uh, That's right. So we uh, we look at um, the counting that Ail uh, that these guys did. We had a uh, an improvement in our thresholds paper, yeah. uh, sure. and we go look at what we did and and see where the inefficiencies are, uh, mm -hmm. see how we can get around that for this particular mm -hmm. hypermark, and yeah, see what we can do. And, but yeah, this last question is uh, extremely interesting, I think. This yeah. Question, probe open problem too, it's, yeah. it's very exciting. And I think Shahar actually, uh, when I talked to him, mentioned some something of the sort, but formulated in for, uh, uh, DNF kind of... Uh, I see language uh -huh. but yeah oh so it sounded it sounded some something uh, so like something uh, something similar but in, in their oh, okay. language does he have something written down no he no no he uh, he also posed it as a kind of uh, a question that he he was thinking about gotcha okay yeah it's a natural question yeah. uh it would be lovely to at least have a good concrete guess um we have loads of examples but to extrapolate from them and uh, arrive at something that's both true and sort of interesting is, yeah, I haven't managed to. Yeah.